1987, developer Microprose put out a Commodore 64 game called Airborne Ranger, featuring the player controlling a lone soldier crossing into enemy territory to complete missions like destroying bunkers or freeing POWs. Computer Gaming World called it Commando with Strategy. The following year, Infograms released a computer game called Hostages, later re-released on the NES as Rescue the Embassy Mission, featuring a team of soldiers using stealth and planning to scope out and rescue people held hostage in an embassy building. It allowed you to place operatives in different locations for different vantage points, taking out enemies from afar and rappelling in to clear the building and free the hostages. It was praised as a unique experience, and over the next decade, little else in the style came out. In 1996, a company called Red Storm Entertainment was founded, and their first major game idea was a product following the FBI hostage rescue team. Red Storm's CEO, a man named Doug Littlejohns, was a former Navy commander and also co-founded the company with his close friend Tom Clancy, maybe the most famous writer of espionage and military fiction in the world. They wanted to create a realistic tactical squad shooter, trying to find a balance between thoughtful strategy and exciting action, and began developing a game called Black Ops. The development team consulted with dozens of military and counter-terrorism experts, and worked hard to make levels feel like realistic locales, not big arenas designed for video game fighting. As is sadly common in much of the history of video games, there was pretty severe crunch to keep the game on schedule, and Clancy, although developing a novelization of the same story in tandem, had little to do with the actual creation of the game. Despite this grind, the game, now renamed Rainbow Six, was shown at E3 1998 and released on PC in August of 1998, to rave reviews for its meticulous structure and its impressive computer players. Rainbow Six was structured into two distinct sections, the planning stage and the action deployment. The planning is the most distinctive phase. You get a briefing, you pick your team from a list of soldiers, each of which have their own specific skill set, put them into little teams and pick their gear and weapons. You're shown a map of the locale and given the option to create your own game plan, to commit orders for different subsections of your little teams, giving them routes to follow and tasks to perform. The game was praised for its detailed structure and thoughtful and responsive AI. There are a series of pre-made mission structures, but you are encouraged to solve the tasks in any way you see fit. But be careful! If your team member is killed during the operation, and this is designed realistically, so like most of us, each operative is killed with a single bullet, you lose them for the entire campaign. Red Storm was the developer for the PC version, but curiously, each of the four ports, three to various consoles and one to the handheld Game Boy Color, was developed by a different company. It would make sense that the Game Boy Color version would have to be different, and the game UK developer Crawfish Interactive produced looks, fittingly, a lot like its tactical forebears like Airborne Ranger, Hostages, and Metal Gear. Metal Gear. It got dinged for being pared down enough that there wasn't a lot of strategic planning involved, but was said to be surprisingly faithful otherwise. The PlayStation version, developed by Rebellion Developments, the creators of beloved FPS Alien vs. Predator, was absolutely roasted by critics for entirely removing the tactical planning stages and making it just a bad first-person shooter with some truly awful graphics. PlayStation Magazine called it, quote, an uninspired FPS with some weird hostage-saving minigame tacked on. The N64 version was developed by a company called Sapphire, who to that point had mostly done some co-development on the awful fighting game Biofreaks, as well as, for some reason, multiple branded bowling games. 
Animaniacs 10 Pin Alley for the PS1, and Nestor's Funky Bowling on the Virtual Boy. The 64 port was surprisingly praised. It had to be stunted and shortened to work well, but the graphics and function were complemented highly. I actually rented the N64 version as a kid, and I found it really hard to wrap my head around as an 11-year-old. My main memory is feeling like I wasn't smart enough or familiar with what proper tactics would look like to strategize properly. And then I just remember a lot of computer characters sprinting into walls trying to turn corners. The Dreamcast version, today's actual subject, released six months after the PS1 version, and nearly two full years after the original PC release, developed by a company called Pipe Dream Interactive, assuages a bunch of those issues. The graphics look clean and solid, essentially the equal of the PC version, and much better than the other console versions. But I still feel like I'm not quite smart enough to navigate the game's full depths. The United States military holds, like, negative interest for me, so I have never thought about tactics or positioning or door breaches or flashbang grenades. And so, even using the preset plans, I got my dudes killed a bunch of times, when I could even figure out how to get inside the building. I usually try to go in blind, but after an hour or two, I had to commit to some research. And I learned enough to follow, and although I still got, like, half my guys killed, I advanced through it, damn it. A lot of, oh, I can climb the trestle, and started to at least conceptualize what I was supposed to be doing, and what was possible with the game. I've talked a lot about how the Dreamcast occupies a weird position in the history of shooters as essentially the final major console without twin-stick controls, which became a de facto requirement of the genre shortly thereafter. Rainbow Six is so deep and complex in its structure that it feels like there almost isn't enough buttons on the Dreamcast controller to fully encapsulate the experience. It made me really want to seek out and play the original PC version, because this feels like a game that really needs a little more button space. On the Dreamcast controller, so much button space is being taken up for movement that quite a few features are smashed into a couple buttons. And Eric Wolpaw at GameSpot said he felt the game was very good, but one of his critiques was a method of issuing commands that he called, quote, unusually complex, specifying that there's over 35 individual comments that require specific combinations of joystick and button inputs, despite the eight-month development delay to iron out issues. There are lots of games that I've played for this project in genres I'm entirely unfamiliar with, and some of them I've finished playing and thought, Woo! Glad I never have to play that again! And then there are some that make me say, This is cool! I'd love to know more about this game. I'd love to get better at this game. Rainbow Six is the latter. For me, the appeal of realism is not graphical accuracy, so much as just the opportunity to think outside the box for solutions to problems. And Rainbow Six, while still flawed, encourages a kind of forethought that few other games ask. And the computer players are good enough that it's rarely distracting, and once I actually kind of wrapped my head around it, it was just a cool idea, man. I absolutely get why people would be interested in this series, and I'm excited to play more. We will see Rainbow Six on this project again. Next time... No, 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 this isn't Virtua anything. We're bringing in a pro 2000.